Hi, everyone. We're going to get started now. Um, thank you so much for joining the first lectures in planning lecture this week. Um, our speaker for today is Cheryl Ann Simpson, assistant professor at Carleton University. My name is Makara Maljumbo. I'm a PhD student here at Columbia in the Urban Planning Program, and I'm going to be moderating today's session. Um, few technical things because today we have a hybrid version, um, and then we'll go right into the introducing the speaker and having the talk happen. So during the talk, for those who are on Zoom, please mute your microphones. Um, we're recording, so you should have gotten that notification already. And to anyone who doesn't want to have their face videoed, make sure your video is off on the Zoom end of uh, side of things. The chat box is going to be used for only just dis like discussion about the session. If you've got a technical issue, um, please send that message over to Taisha Mao, who's one of my uh, cohort mates. Um, and lastly, we encourage you to type in questions throughout the lecture in the chat box, and we'll get to those during Q&A. The Q&A is going to start around 2 to 10, um, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. I'm going to be coordinating Q&A with an eye to diversity and inclusion, so make sure that if you've already had a chance to ask a question, you give the space for others to ask questions as well. With that, um, I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, Professor Sherilyn Simpson. Um, Sherilyn's research and teaching are informed by an interest in the ways in which states and communities interact in place. She asks questions such as how are government policies and programs implemented or translated into everyday experiences? How do community members use, narrate, and shape their environments? And in turn, how do those actions and stories influence new government policies and programs? She focuses this general interest through questions around citizenship and immigration and environmental justice and urban health. These interests also reflect Simpson's interdisciplinary training centered around social planning and community development with stops in political science, biology, and geography. So with that, all of Professor Simpson's work is strongly informed by both feminist and critical perspectives and so praxis, bringing together ideas and action and a focus on using methods and technology to promote increased social justice are also important links between all of her research. Um, so today, Professor Simpson's lecture called Performing and Audiencing Citizenship will examine the idea of citizenship, its conceptualization, its practices, and asking how exclusion from this category impacts claims making within communities and how planners also react and engage with these negotiations of citizenship. So with that, I will pass things over to you. Thanks so much for that generous introduction. It's always so funny to like, you're like, wait, is that what I do? Is that, yeah, that, okay, I think that's what I do. <laughs> so thank you so much. And thanks for the invitation as well. I'm so happy to join you guys and be able to join virtually and kick off what uh, looks like it's gonna be a really great, another really great speaker series. I'm always kind of, I always feel like the Columbia grad students put together like a great show. So I'm glad to be a part of it. So yeah, I am going to be talking today about this idea of performing and audiencing citizenship. Um, I was asked to kind of speak about my work that focuses um, around questions of immigration and citizenship. That's kind of one part of the bulk of the work that I do. And so that's what I'm going to be focusing on uh, today. And I look at this question of immigration and citizenship from a couple of different ways. Uh, I don't really look at migration per se. My questions aren't so much sort of what uh, induces people to move or how people move. My questions are really about kind of what happens when people get to the new place. So these questions of citizenship formation become an important part of the work, really trying to think about how people become citizens. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that slightly fraught term in a second. So some of the work that I've done around this area has been very, very quantitative, and it's looked really very specifically around policy questions and looking at sort of settlement questions from a quantitative perspective. And I'm not going to talk very much about that work today unless folks want me to during the q and I'm always happy to talk about that as well. Um, but I just wanted to toss up a couple of references of work that I've done, uh, especially some collaborative work that I've done with a colleague, Ann Visser, who's at UC Davis, looking at municipal immigration policy, so really trying to think about what cities are doing around immigration, incorporation, citizenship formation. 
And then also some work that I've done uh, just looking at settlement questions. So trying to understand kind of like how and why people end up in the neighborhoods that they end up in and looking at that sort of in a quantitative way. But what I'm going to talk about today is work that is sort of more qualitative, interpretive, um, and that looks at this question again of citizenship formation. But thinking about citizenship, not just in terms of formal citizenship, not just in terms of thinking about, you know, whether or not someone has a passport, whether or not somebody um, has status, but really thinking about citizenship more broadly as this kind of status of equal membership in a self-governing polity and thinking about all the attendant rights and responsibilities that come along with that membership. So that's the kind of definition of citizenship that we're playing with today. The other perspective on citizenship comes out of this idea of sort of feminist practices um, in geography and in planning um, and thinking about critical practices and praxis as well. And so I'm also drawing on this idea of ordinary citizenship and um, Staheli, Urkem, Leitner and Naga really um, helps to define this idea of ordinary citizenship by pulling out these two distinct meanings of ordinary. So on the one hand, thinking about ordinary as being average or everyday, so trying to understand just what people do in place, how they do it, who they do it with, but also thinking about kind of the origin of the word ordinary and that, that, um, that aspect of order more specifically. So the idea also of trying to think about what are those kind of social and legal orders that shape and conditions what people can do in those average or everyday ways. So that's the, these are some of the ideas around citizenship that I'm trying to think about, really looking at that idea of membership and then really trying to um, play with this relationship between what people can do in their everyday lives and the kinds of social and legal orders that shape and conditions what we can actually do. And when we think about these social and legal orders, planning definitely becomes a really important part of that, especially when we're thinking about the urban scale or the neighborhood scale, which is where a lot of my work kind of has started and, and still sits. So I titled the talk today, Performing and Audiencing Citizenship. Um, and what I mean by that, right, is trying to think sort of methodologically um, around the lenses through which we can look for this relationship, this kind of dialectic between these different definitions of ordinary. So when we think about performances, right, drawing on performance studies, but also drawing on research, um, research, research methodologies that focus on more than or non-representational methodologies, we're thinking about the work that's done through actions, relationships, emotions, and through the body itself. So really trying to pay attention to questions of affect, trying to pay attention to questions of emotion, trying to pay attention to materiality, what people are actually doing, who they're actually doing it with, rather than just looking at the representations of place. So again, going back to that materiality, questions of affect, questions of emotion. And so thinking about this idea of citizenship and citizenship formation through that lens of performance. So again, when we think about this idea of performing citizenship, what I'm talking about there are performances or works um, through action, relationships, emotion, the body, where the work is to constitute full membership. So asking what people do, how they do it, what the material spaces are of people trying to gain or trying to um, constitute that full membership in those self bod in those self governing polities. I know all of these like lovely words. Okay. So the other part of the talk is this idea of audiencing. And I think that audiencing becomes really important in part because a lot of the work that I've done around immigration has really been relational, right? It's been about that dialectic between those different kinds of ordinaries, the actions that people take and um, the, the social and legal orders that shape and condition those actions, but also specifically thinking about immigration. A lot of immigration research really focuses on sort of the acts, the cultures, the practices of immigrant residents. A lot, of a lot of immigration research for that reason also often focuses on one specific group. So you're looking at Turkish immigrants in Berlin, you know, you're looking at Mexican immigrants in Georgia, right? You're looking at these at specific groups. And that does a couple of different things. One of the things that it does is it kind of um, reifies or solidifies the idea that the polities that people are coming into are uh, hom are homogenous holes, 
So it reifies this idea that, you know, if we're talking about the United States, for example, that the American policy is one homogenous whole. And that's obviously not true, right? There's a huge amount of diversity, a huge amount of conflict, a huge amount of, of debate, right, within the American context about who should be a full member, about what membership should look like, about what rights and responsibilities, right, should be afforded to full members. So when we focus our immigration studies purely on immigrant residents, trying to ask and look at what they do, what we do is, again, we ignore that other side of the ordinary. We ignore the, the sort of social and legal orders that condition what people are actually able to do and what people choose to do. It also does the thing of flattening the politics of the work that we do as well. So particularly thinking about planning, right? Planning is highly political. It's highly contested. We're dealing with um, you know, scarce resources. We're dealing with power. We're dealing with material conditions, right? It's a highly political field. But if we think about planning for immigration or planning with immigrant residents as something that's about immigrants, again, it lets planning off the hook. It lets us not think about or engage with or query our own practices, our own cultures within that, that institution. So if I'm thinking about citizenship as a performance, the other end of that performance is this idea of audiencing. And again, within performance studies, folks talk about the idea of audiencing in terms of the ideas around recognition and legibility. So, you know, is there an audience present that can recognize the performance, right? When we're thinking about citizenship performances in particular, is there an audience that can recognize um, the performances, for example, of immigrant residents as citizenship performances? Are those performances legible to the audience? Is the audience making, making itself um, available to take in um, those, um, those performances. And so again, like looking at that idea of audiencing, right, it sort of flips the, the site of study, it flips the, the, the focus of the study. And it flips it also to help us kind of think about and understand, right, this whole, the whole um, process of the performance of citizenship, including this idea that one of the things that the state in particular does to kind of govern citizenship, again, is not just about these sort of formal rights or formal responsibilities, but it's also in this idea of how practices, tropes of belonging and identity concerns um, are produced and constituted. So how those kinds of what kinds of practices are narrated as or recognized as or become legible as citizenship practices? What kinds of tropes of belonging? What kinds of identity concerns are considered legitimate um, in conversations around citizenship? So again, this idea of audiencing, right, is a, it's a relational way of thinking about performances of citizenship that shine a light on and highlight not just immigrant residents, but also thinking about the work of non-immigrant uh, residents, organizations, institutions, including the state and including planning and planners. So that's that relationship that we're trying to build. This isn't, this wasn't sort of like a really linear way of thinking about this. Like it wasn't like I sort of sat down and started my research by being like, cool, I'm going to look at performances of citizenship and audiencing, and it's all going to be relational. That's going to how it's going to happen. I think sometimes when we present our final products, that's often the way it gets presented. Like it's very, it all seems very linear. You knew what you were doing from the start. You just did it. That's not the way that research, you know, actually happens for the most part, or that's not what I found at least. And so for me, it's been a really iterative process to get here. Um, and part of that iterative process has been work that I've been doing now for quite some time um, in two neighborhoods in particular and two cities in particular. So I wanna kind of talk about those places for a little bit and kind of talk about sort of how and where I started to think about these ideas of performancing and audiencing um, and some of the ways that uh, listening to these places helped me and allowed me to kind of think, um, think about planning and to think about citizenship in these ways. So the two places are um, two neighborhoods Nombro, which is in Copenhagen, so the capital of uh, Denmark, right in the Hofstede region, so the central, the, the central or capital region of the, of the country. And then the other one um, is a neighborhood called Spence, and then sort of part of the neighbor, the sort of cluster of neighborhood, neighboring West End neighborhoods, which is in a city called Winnipeg, which is sort of right smack dab in the middle of Canada, um, governed by Treaty One and in the heart of the Métis Nation. And so I looked at I looked at these neighborhoods um, in part because they are there. It's a weird 
It's a weird sort of um, comparative, but I was looking at them for a couple of different reasons. They are neighborhoods that are in very distinct national contexts, right? The Canadian context versus the Danish context, but they're also neighborhoods that have sort of a lot of like weirdly shared conditions. And so part of that is that they're both in cities where um, international immigration had increased quite significantly, sort of from the kind of, early 2000s and then moving forward. The character of international immigration was also shifting quite a bit in both of these neighborhoods. Um, Manitoba and Winnipeg had, had a lot of Eastern European immigration classically, and there's still quite a bit of, of Eastern European immigration that's happening, but there's also been quite a bit of an expansion. So there's a lot more folks that are immigrating um, from West African countries and East African countries. There's a lot more folks that are immigrating from um, Southeast Asia, uh, the Philippines in particular. There's, there's a long-standing Filipino community in Winnipeg, but there's also been quite a bit of an increase in other South Asian um, communities also migrating there, and also an increase in folks migrating from South America. So there's been this kind of shift, right, in terms of kind of who's immigrating um, and sort of in many ways, like a visible shift, right, in who the, the immigrant residents are in these places. In Copenhagen, similarly, there's always been like a lot of like European immigration in Copenhagen. There's also been like waves of, for example, like again, like Filipino um, immigration to Copenhagen as well, small waves, but still waves. But there'd been quite an expansion. So again, there'd been uh, quite an expansion of Eastern European uh, migration, also a real large expansion of folks moving from West Asia or um, the Middle East, Northern Africa. Um, and then also, um, sorry, sorry. And also, sorry, West Africa. I might've already said that, but just in case I didn't. So also kind of a wave of folks moving from West Africa. So you had this situation that was kind of unique in a lot of ways, distinct from like Toronto or New York or London, right? Places that have kind of longstanding established large uh, immigrant resident populations. We had the situation where both of these cities were really developing their kind of infrastructure around uh, immigration and immigration services. And they were developing in them in this period of like deep neoliberalization or liberalization in both contexts. And that was happening in distinct ways in both countries. So that was kind of my starting point was trying to figure out, right, trying to tease out how much that national context impacted what was happening at the local scale. And so I did that in a couple of different ways. But again, like I said today, I really want to focus on that, that idea of um, of the performances of citizenship. So what were the contexts of these nations and these neighborhoods? How were they kind of impacting performances of citizenship? And again, I didn't necessarily set out with this sort of like very clear framework of performance of performances of citizenship, but it emerged from the research in a lot of ways because people talked about um, membership and rights and responsibility connected to the state and the nation state in sort of surprising ways, in ways I wasn't necessarily expecting. And so these are just two examples, um, one from Copenhagen, one from Winnipeg. Um, they're both mums and they're both mums talking about these questions of or ideas around home ownership and buying a home. And this became a real interesting site of conversation around citizenship, which I wouldn't necessarily have expected, but people were tying in narratives of home ownership and tying in narratives of, um, of home and access to home. They were tying them really directly into these questions of sort of the state and citizenship and belonging. Um, so for, for in this case, right, we, we have our um, this interviewee, my interlocutor, and she sort of talks, she's talking about the idea of like, of her and her partner, they found out they were pregnant, they needed to buy a house because they needed someplace bigger to live or a flat or an apartment at least. And she's talking about the process and saying it was demoralizing trying to find a place to buy. People didn't take us seriously. They didn't want to sell to immigrants. And then she goes on to talk about the idea that it's just that aspect of not being thought of as here or not being thought of first. And in that bracket, she sort of talks about the idea that like they had told all their friends that they were looking for some place to live, but people would constantly just like not tell them about a place. So they would hear that so-and-so is selling their flat and be like, we told you we were looking for something. Why didn't you let us know? But as she goes on, right, it's that constant negotiation of, oh, you're still here. It doesn't register that like as a foreigner, you'd want to be here. Here. And then like on the other flip side of that is people not wanting to share access to things. 
So it's both things. And then in the Canadian case, um, this in the Canadian case, again, this is somebody who also had you know, purchased their own home. And she was talking about what that process of purchasing her home had meant, right? And sort of situating it for herself. And so she talks about the idea of, um, okay, so I've done what I was supposed to. I've learned the language, I've worked, I pay taxes, I do care about the country, but what do I have in the country, right? Okay, so I've applied for citizen, I became citizen. Well, the last thing you need is a home to feel at home, right? So in both of these cases, right, what we see is we see um, something that I found in common in a lot of the kinds of ways in which people were describing or narrating these performances of citizenship in unexpected ways. But one of the things that I found in common in these dense urban spaces was really a sense of people uh, performing in a way that laid uh, a claim to space, that really sort of claimed space for themselves. That was a really important aspect of the kinds of performances that people um, highlighted. And there were lots of different kinds of performances. There are stories of people like cleaning up trash in their neighborhoods. There are stories um, you know, of people you know, occupying park spaces in particular ways. There were all these different kinds of stories, but one of the things that they really came back to was this idea of really of occupying space. And that idea of being able to hold space being a really important act of performing citizenship and a really important way that people saw themselves um, being able to enter into that full membership, being able to claim their rights, being able also though to take responsibility for the spaces that they were in. Another theme that kind of comes up quite a bit, and we see this a little bit in this um, in this quote, is also this idea of um, of resources and one really important resource being information. So that idea that one of the ways in which people were sort of um, claiming membership was that idea of amassing information, but also disseminating it to other immigrant residents. So being that kind of hub point where you could share information with other immigrant residents to make sure that people could gain access to um, material needs and material resources became another kind of way that people talked about and really performed citizenship in both of these cases. So that's just like a little like, you know, flavor of it. But what I want to talk about instead is kind of the outcomes of these performances. So what I found was that actually people were doing quite similar things in both of these places. And immigrant residents from a variety of different backgrounds were also doing relatively similar things. So for example, you know, in these two quotes, right, this is actually um, somebody who's immigrated from the US. This is um, somebody who um, had, who had actually immigrated from um, Eastern Africa. And so in both of these cases, we have people coming from very, very different places, but actually, you know, acting as immigrant residents and claiming citizenship in very similar ways, right, in terms of this idea of claiming space. But what was interesting was actually that in both of the two cases, the outcome of these performances I found were what was were distinct. And those outcomes were really, again, determined by that process of or audiencing. It wasn't so much what immigrant residents were doing, it was the ways in which the state and other non-immigrant residents were able to take in or hear or read those performances. And so what I found was that there were sort of like two different outcomes. And I'm, I call one this idea of liminal citizenship, and I call this other one this idea of, of interstitial, interstitial citizenship. And what I mean by liminal is this idea of being in a threshold. So I found uh, this outcome more commonly in the Canadian context. And so what I mean by that is that people were seeing a way through to citizenship in the Canadian context. It was sort of like, if I do these things, if I act in this way, if I make these connections, if I share these resources, if I claim space in this way, people saw a way through. So they saw their performances of citizenship as being kind of creating a threshold to move from the status of being an immigrant into this status of being a Canadian or being Canadian citizenship. And so the thing that was kind of distinct as well about the performances is that people often kind of talked about their performances as having kind of an implied outside audience. Um, so people were doing things to kind of show and prove, right, their membership, to show and prove to those non-immigrant institutions that they did belong, that they were claiming space in a proper way, um, that they were making change or they were making a contribution to place. Because there was this understanding or belief that if that happened, there was sort of a way through into citizenship. <laughs> 
In the Danish case, what I actually found was something a little bit different. This idea of being interstitial. So interstitial is like all those sort of spaces in between muscle muscles. So it's these spaces where there's kind of no out, there's no kind of way in, right? The space, the void is the space itself. And that's what I found, um, that's how I found a lot of people in the Danish case were really kind of analyzing their situation and their condition. They didn't necessarily see what they were doing as something that would move them through into being Danish or into Danish citizenship. Instead, the audiencing was really kind of turned inward. So people were still claiming space, they were sharing resources, they were making material resources available or sharing information, um, making material resources available to other folks, but it wasn't, they weren't narrating those actions in terms of kind of like making a way in. They were narrating those actions very much in terms of the idea of like creating their own polities within their neighborhoods, within their communities. And this, has been, this is something that's been identified in a lot of ways in Danish policy, um, Danish immigration policy, Danish settlement policy. But in Danish policy, the way that it's uh, described and analyzed is the idea that people are rejecting uh, Danish citizenship and Danish, Danish society. And I'll talk about this in a second. There's a whole bunch of kind of policy responses that are prefaced on this idea that people are somehow rejecting uh, Danishness or Danish society or wanting to be a part of that. But what I found instead was this, this sort of outcome of interstitial citizenship, right? This idea that people were thinking about and analyzing and understanding their performances as you know, turned inwards as performances for themselves, as building a citizenship that was kind of, um, you know, in between Danish society, was really uh, more so prefaced on people's perception of a rejection from Danish society. So it wasn't that people were like, oh, we don't want to be involved. It was that people were constantly feeling that their performances were not being audienced well. They were not being understood as performances of citizenship Rather, they were being understood as disruptions or as noise, almost. And so I want to sit with this idea of interstitial citizenship for a minute, because I think that, um, I mean, in part because I think planners spend a lot of time talking about Denmark as like this example, but maybe we can think about Denmark for a second, actually, as like a cautionary tale instead. So um, I'll start here. This is an image that I've used a lot in my research and in presentations. At some point I was like, I need to stop showing this image. But to be honest about it, it keeps on drawing me back in and, I, and it keeps on asking me to think with it. So I'm gonna think with it for a little bit longer. So one of the things that I did um, in early work in these neighborhoods was that um, I did a lot of interviews with uh, immigrant residents and that work has continued in lots of different formats over the years. But in some early, some early interviews, right, when I, I would do these narrative interviews with folks, and I was asking them about their neighborhoods and about their homes. And this is where those narratives around citizenship really popped up. But one of the things that I did as part of those interviews was I asked, I would ask people to draw um, maps of the places where they lived or their city. And when, they, when I asked them to draw those maps of the city, I asked them specifically to just draw the places that had meaning to them, the places that they went, that they cared about, that they went to. And so this is one of the maps um, that was drawn. And it was drawn by a, a resident who lives in an area that has been labeled by the, 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 the Danish government, a ghetto umrade, so a ghetto place. Um, I love that that's like an official term in Danish policy, which just uh, says a lot about translation, which is not my area, but I, but I would love to, you know, it's always interesting to think about. But ghettos have been defined in Denmark in a very particular way. It's, it's literally, they are a thing in Danish policy, and they are defined as places where a certain percentage of the population um, is either uh, from a non-Western country or is the descendant of a non-Western or uh, somebody from a non-Western country, um, where a certain number of people are out of work or out of school, and where a certain number of people have been um, convicted of certain kinds of crimes. So that's the definition of a ghetto. So again, right, it's this idea of defining these sort of spaces of disruption by the people themselves. And just being a person from a quote unquote non-Western country is enough of a disruption. So again, right, that's the kind of like, um, that's the kind of sort of feeling pushed out, right, the need to build these interstitial spaces um, that we see in this in the Danish context. So I show this one because it's just like, 
it's it's just lovely. Like it's just a really lovely depiction, right? And this was somebody um, whose English wasn't very strong. My Danish isn't very strong. My Arabic is non-existent. So the interview had been like a bit choppy, but once he had this kind of this object to actually talk about, um, there's so many like interesting things that came out. And so, you know, on the one hand, right, this is a ghetto umrada, it's a ghetto place. It's beautiful, right? Because this is home. This is his home and it's a beautiful place for him. And he, you know, he drew all of these sort of like lovely things. Like he, you know, really highlighted the importance of sports. That was one thing. Um, bicycles kind of came in, which was like a, an important running theme as, as planners know about Copenhagen, right? So bikes were present in his Copenhagen as well. But the other thing that he drew that he was really adamant about drawing and that he explained um, was this, these, all these little satellite dishes. And I've been, people have told me multiple times this isn't how satellite dishes work, but that's not the point. The point is the narrative and the analysis and the understanding. And the satellite dishes, the way that he described it was that they were sort of turned in lots of different directions. And depending on what direction they were turned, sort of told you uh, like whose country they were beaming information in from, right? So he was like, my Palestinian friends, theirs face this way. You know, my Somali friends, theirs face this way. My Lebanese friends, theirs face this way. But again, right, it was this really interesting idea, right, of uh, a performance of citizenship that they had in common, which was actually about being connected to other places as well. That was actually a way in which they were building place together. They were producing place together, was also staying connected to those other places and bringing those narratives back in to be able to share and exchange with each other. And that's how he described these satellite dishes, really is these, this sort of connective thread. Now I keep on thinking with this image in part because the Danish government keeps on thinking with this image as well. And so this is a report from uh, 2010. Uh, the title is um, the, uh, the Ghetto to Society, uh, like a, a, a conflict against or like a fight against uh, parallel societies in Denmark. And the satellite dish shows up as like this key image, right, in, in this document. It became, it's become the symbol, right, for the Danish government of this like symbol of people, you know, again, rejecting Danish society, of creating these parallel societies of not wanting to become or to be Danish, right? This idea that people are connecting back home became this like weird running thread um, as part of the imagery of these, of these, um, these ghetto places, these, this parallel society. And then in 2018, right, there's another report that's put out. Um, it's a Denmark, Denmark without, or sorry, a Denmark without the parallel society, uh, no ghettos by 2030. So that's like kind of the, the more current policy, right? But we still have this kind of running theme of parallel societies. We still have this parallel theme of like needing to get rid of these ghetto places where these people from non-Western countries are clustered together. Um, and this is, and and this is the image that's there, right? This image of Denmark without a parallel society. And this is just like an aerial antenna <laughs> that like beams in like only Danish television. And so again, right? Like it's such a bizarre, but like intentional thing that the Danish government, right? Is, is highlighting in these sort of sparse, you know, these relatively sparse images that like there's, there's sort of one key image, right? Is this shift from these satellites to, um, to these aerial antennas, right? That are gonna keep people, that are gonna make people Danish. So again, right, it's this inability, right, as an audience, right, the inability of the, the Danish government as an audience to actually understand and to read and perceive the performances that are being made by these immigrant residents, right, that becomes kind of the focus. And again, I think it's something that planning can learn from because I think within planning, we also often have this inability to understand or read or audience particular kinds of performances that don't fall within a very narrow category of what the performance performances of citizenship should be. So thinking about like that disruptive, that quote unquote disruptive person at the meeting, right? That's not considered a, a it's not considered a performance of citizenship, right? We relegate it to sort of noise, to disruption, to being sort of parallel to the ideas that planners want to have. But what happens when we listen to those uh, performances in a different way, right? What happens when we listen to those performances a different way and also ask like, why, right? Why are these parallel, why do folks within these quote unquote parallel societies or these interstitial places why are they acting in these ways that are turned in rather than turned out?
Um, and so these are just two quotes as well that kind of, again, just sort of speak to the ways in which immigrant residents are sort of analyzing that question, right? The way that they're analyzing the audiencing of Denmark. And so um, one, this came from uh, one young man who also um, lives in a ghetto Omrada, a ghetto place. And he talks about the idea of like, this is actually somebody who was born in Denmark as well. And he talks about the idea like that I'm not Danish. I'll never be so white, blue eyes, et cetera. But this place, speaking again about um, this, um, this ghetto Anglada, this, you know, which is considered this parallel society, right, this like, you know, crumbling place that needs to be fixed, when he talks about it, when he says um, this place, where we can keep some of our culture and our traditions, they say we have to integrate, but I'm Danish Pakistani, and I think like anyone with an immigrant background. And so he, I interviewed a group of, uh, group of youth, uh, they were 18, 18, 19 year olds, but I interviewed a group of them and the same kind of came up over and over again, this idea that again, they were creating their own space, right? A Danish Pakistani identity, a Danish Lebanese, a Danish Sudanese identity, but like that they were creating their own, their own sort of meaning, their own polity that they wanted to be a member of. And again, right, it was about this kind of rejection from that, uh, that polity that they couldn't, they couldn't find a threshold into. Right. If the threshold into Danishness is being blonde and blue eyed, there's there's no sort of threshold for them. So they were producing their own spaces and they were producing their own policies in these really interesting ways. And then one other quote uh, around this um, that I think, again, is really relevant when we're trying to think about this relationship between citizenship and planning is this came from a, um, a resident who uh, had moved from Eastern Europe for education. And he was describing Denmark sort of towards the end of the interview. And he said, oh, Denmark, it's the oh, Denmark is unbelievable country. I mean, it's so diverse. As I said, there is an abundance of crafty people, nasty people, awful people. On the other hand, there's really a great number of unbelievable people in terms of being so nice, so good, so, so eager to help. The others are so, so help, eager to help you, the others, believing and sharing and everything. So there's two Denmarks, one nasty and one beautiful. And so again, I think, you know, as planners, if we want to uh, learn from Denmark, right, we, we love Denmark as an example, but Denmark, again, is this kind of cautionary tale. Because I see within planning practice, again, these kind of same tendencies, right, that there is on the one hand, this, that there is sort of a, a nasty part to planning, right, and that is the exclusionary part, that is the part that, um, you know, maintains these boundaries and maintains um, these expectations, right, that people can't move through. But there's also this potential, at least, for the idea of like a beautiful planning, right? A planning that is more open and more able to audience some of these performances. And so that's kind of where my research has moved, right? Really kind of trying to think with and play with these ideas that I learned from um, my interlocutors um, in these two neighborhoods to try and think about, you know, what would that beautiful planning look like? What would be some of the possibilities for that beautiful planning? But also also, right, to kind of learn from what I, you know, learn from this process of trying to listen differently and to try and think about like how that could be used or what I could learn from that to think about other places. So I'll just quickly talk about um, one project that, that is sort of bringing some of that thinking forward. Um, and that's a project that I've been looking, that I've been working on and I'm starting to write up about now that's looking at this idea of citizenship formation, but looking at it in a rural context. And specifically, I'm looking at it in this little spot here, uh, which is Parkland, Manitoba. So Winnipeg is there, you see we're in, right in the middle of Canada, Parkland's there, it's sort of like three to five hours outside of uh, Winnipeg, depending on where you are. Again, it's like kind of right smack in the middle of the country and the continent. Um, it's mostly in uh, Treaty 2, but then a little bit in Treaty 4 as well up in the north. And part of the question that I'm working with here is this idea of really taking the politics of rural life seriously. So in this project, I'm not looking just at immigrant residents, but I'm looking at immigrant residents and then also looking at young adults. So other folks that are kind of like moving into citizenship um, and looking at both indigenous and non-indigenous um, young adults, right? So looking at how these sort of three groups within the same place are or aren't able to navigate that process of citizenship formation.
And you know, listening to the rural, listening to rural places, I think again is really interesting, and important in part because right, so much of planning is focused on like big urban centers, and even you know, Winnipeg, even Winnipeg, even Copenhagen, right, compared to someplace like Parkland, is quite dense and quite urban. And so, like I said, a lot of the sort of practices of citizenship that people were undertaking were really focused on these like claims to you know scarce space. They were really focused on um, this idea of um, you know, trying to disseminate, you know, information for scarce resources. But in Parkland, I've been finding something a little bit different. Where I, what I'm finding is that a lot of the performances to citizenship, performances of citizenship are really focused on ideas around working with the land, movement on the land, and then also a really strong focus on collective memory making. This idea that you're sort of claiming place, not necessarily through like having to like buy a house, having to like, you know, be in a park, having to stake claim in that way, but through this process of collective memory making. That's been a really important aspect of how um, I'm finding folks performing citizenship in rural contexts. And so, you know, part of that, you know, thinking about things like working on the land, right, people, you know, there's still a lot of agriculture, but there's also a lot of kind of like cultural agriculture is almost what I would say. So people, for example, talk about the idea that they farm because they wanna make sure that their kids have a strong work ethic, right? That's a conversation that folks have a lot. Working on the land can also be like recreational work on the land. So that idea that like citizenship is claimed by being somebody who, you know, goes out to the parks, who boats, who hikes, who fishes, right? All of those things actually become these ways that people talk about, right? their membership in place. And they talk about the ways in which they are kind of trying to weave themselves into place. Movement is also really important. These are super vast areas. So, you know, it's everything from, you know, people, people are sort of like, yeah, you know who everyone is by their vehicles, right? Because everybody has to kind of drive everywhere or tends to drive everywhere. But movement on the land is also important in terms of ideas around immigration. So one of the things that's really interesting and thinking about collective memory making as well is as you start, as I've been, one of the things I've been looking at has been um, community histories that have kind of been produced about the area over time. So starting in the 1800s, but then again, sort of a, a burst in 1970 um, around the centenary of Manitoba as well. But as you look at these, something that's really interesting is the way that immigration actually gets used over and over again as a sign of membership. So people's claim to membership is about coming from someplace else. So it's the Icelandic family, it's the Ukrainian family, it's the British family, it's the German family. And so now as new immigrant residents are making their way to Parkland, again, from South Asia, from Africa, right? As people are making their way towards um, Parkland, actually being welcomed to immigrant, immigrant residents has actually become um, part of this, again, trope and performance of citizenship, right? But that's the narrative that's being constructed in this rural place that is actually really important to um, to be welcoming to new immigrant residents because people have maintained over two and three and four generations these this idea of being people who come from someplace else. It also does an important it also does important work in this sort of context of uh, the prairies in the context of Canada as a settler colonial country. Is that it also though um, elides uh, indigenous claims of membership. So it does a funny, there's sort of like a funny two way street here, right, where like being from someplace else, being able to move in and around the space, right, that freedom of movement is actually a sign of membership. But what it does is it means that the people who've always been here, right, fall out as members in dominant narratives. So I think, you know, when I talk about this idea of citizenship and performances of citizenship, it's not always, uh, these are not always political performances. Performances of citizenship might be counter to the state, right, or they might be otherwise from state narratives around citizenship, as we see in processes of interstitial citizenship, but they might also be uh, performances of citizenship that actually, um, you know, stabilize and enhance these often uneven ways in which memberships, rights, and responsibility are doled out by the state. So again, trying to understand this in this rural context has been really fruitful in a lot of different ways. And part of that has just been methodological, where I've had to listen in a really different way as compared to the work that I've done in urban places. So I can't just like 
show up and like assume that stuff's going to be happening or that it's going to be really visible to me, right? I've had to listen in really distinct ways um, to these to these rural places. Um, and part of that is this idea of listening to silence um, as signal as well. So in that same way that in urban context, often, right, we, we talk about a lot of what's going on as kind of being noise. In the rural context, I've had to kind of try and listen more carefully to the silence and try and really understand materially what that is. And I've written about that um, here, and I'd be happy to chat about that more um, in the question and answer if people are interested. Um, the other thing, right, is this idea of taking the politics of rural life seriously also means, again, not trying to homogenize rural life, but really trying to focus on trying to find the, simultane the simul simultaneity of stories so far. Um, and that's the way that Doreen Massey, um, the really phenomenal geographer Doreen Massey, talked about the idea of what politics were. This idea that politics were about openness um, and the politics of place specifically, like the places were political, specifically because there was this simultaneity of stories so far. There were these coming together of people, different people, stories and, pers and perspectives. And so again, right, that's been part of taking the, the politics of, of rurality seriously, has been trying to kind of, you know, find those spots to find that simultaneity simultaneity of stories so far. And one of the ways that I've done that um, has been through um, a focus on uh, ordinary photography. And so folks like um, Pied uh, uh, Celeste Pedri Spade talk about this idea of ordinary photography as being important because again, it's that idea of, you know, thinking about ordinary in both of those ways, but that idea that, you know, people take uh, images of those everyday photos of, um, of things that are important to them, but also that idea that as those images are taken, right, they become part of those institutions that sort of shape and condition what's possible. So one of the things that I've been looking at, like I said, I've been looking at community histories, um, you know, from the 70s and earlier, but then I've also been looking at Instagram images and thinking about those as sort of contemporary community histories. So not thinking about like social media as being like representative or thinking about it as big data or quantitative, but really trying to think about like the quality and the material aspect of some of these images and trying to think about the ways in which those provide that opportunity to um, think about those simultane uh, simultaneity of stories so far. And so one example has just been um, the ways in which different folks have um, presented images of sort of celebration and of festival in the area. And so, for example, there's a festival in one of the larger cities or larger city, the city in the, in the area called the, it's a Ukrainian cultural festival that happens. And the posts from those are usually from folks who are like, who are often sort of like, you know, Ukrainian identified sort of culturally or family wise. And, you know, you see a mix of people in like traditional, you know, traditional cultural costumes and eating food and dancing and regular clothes. And it's very celebratory. On the other hand, when non-Indigenous folks represent powwow, and I'm not talking about like ceremony or like celebrate, you know, or um, sort of sacred powwow, but like celebratory community powwows, there is this, um, there's this very particular way in which they're represented, which tends to uh, historicize them. So it's always folks in like full regalia. It's often, there's like a lot of like silhouettes, a lot of like profiles, all of the like state, all of the, um, all of the like captions are like very like, I was, you know, they're very long. They're always very long. They're always sort of about like the magic and mysticalness of powwow. Indigenous folks, when they talk about powwow, it's much more like the Ukrainian festival, right? There's folks in full regalia, there's folks in half regalia, folks in t-shirts, there's beers, there's kids, right? It's a celebration. And it talks to what um, Pedri Spade talks about, right? The idea of that, you know, looking at it, uh, ordinary photography from this Indigenous perspective, right, is that reminder of not just the sort of presentness of Indigenous life, but also the futurity of it. So I just wanted to like give those two quick stops um, to like, some of the different ways that I'm having to think about um, citizenship and having to look for and listen for these performances in this rural context. And I want to do that because I think that, again, brings us back to this question of like, 
brings me back to this sort of final question that I want to, you know, make sure that I actually address, which is this idea of, okay, so what does this have to do with planning, right? We're talking about, I'm talking about citizenship, and I'm talking about performance and audiencing. So what does this have to do with planning? And I think, you know, hopefully it connects to planning in a couple of different ways. I've tried to highlight, you know, throughout the chat, you know, this idea of citizenship participation is something now that is kind of taken as a given within planning, right? And sometimes we forget the history of that, but for the most part, it's taken as a given. And I think a couple of things that this idea of looking at citizenship and the performance and audiencing of citizenship helps us to do is it helps us to really rethink where we look for citizenship. So citizenship is not only happening in the meetings that we plan. It's not only happening in City Hall, it's not only happening in the boardrooms that we often go to, like of the developers where we, you know, where we you know, do our negotiations. Instead, really thinking about citizenship and this idea of, of citizenship formation as an ongoing process and also very much as a multi-scalar process. So citizenship is happening, um, you know, in people's bodies, right? In like feelings of belonging that people might have, but also in feelings of rejection that people might have. They're happening in relationship in the ways in which people are relating to each other, in the ways in which they're building their own policies when there's not a way into those policies, for example. Um, but they also, again, they happen through, again, those pro that process of audiencing that is a state process that can be an institutional process. So we need to look for citizenship at multiple scales and we need to be able to think nimbly about the relationship across multiple scales as we're thinking about you know, urban policy as we're thinking about planning more broadly. I think it also helps to think about this idea of audiencing well. So for planners, right, the idea that we want to be, we want to be able to audience well. We want to be able to engage with performances that are challenging, right? Challenging to our norms around what citizens should or shouldn't look like. And that really involves the process of listening differently. So it involves using a full suite of tools and methods and methodologies. Um, and I think one of the things that's always so funny about citizenship participation is if you go back and look at older plans. So like um, I've worked in Providence, Rhode Island as well. And I remember looking at the, you know, the, the participation process for the plan that they did in about like 2015 or so. And it was, it was like, we held a bunch of meetings, but it was really innovative because some of those meetings were in the evening. If you go back and look at the 1970s, the citizenship, the participation that they did was door knocking. And it was door knocking, especially in neighborhoods where they knew that people weren't going to come to meetings. So we have a huge range of methods and methodologies we can use to listen to people. They can be digital, they can be analog, they can be in community, right? They can be in service, and we need to use that full range. We also need to let that audiencing affect our solutions and our politics, right? So we need to be able to sort of analyze and sort through those those performances um, that maintain inequitable norms and that disrupt them. And we need to let those performances change us. So not just sort of, you know, you watch it, you go away, but that we really let it seep into our practice and into our theories. And I think the other, the other thing about this idea of thinking about performance and audiencing is that it also shifts the positionality of planners. Um, and Ariam, um, Ariam Torres, who just graduated from uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, said this really amazing thing at a panel around abolition and planning, where he talked about the idea of planning planners not being the protagonists. And I think that's what we need to start thinking about, right? Is that planners are not the protagonist in urban development. We are the audience, right? We need to be an active audience. We need to be an audience that does something with what we hear, but we are not the protagonist. And I really love that idea. So the last thing is that, you know, the last thing that I'm trying to do with all of this thinking um, is, again, trying to think about how, you know, how I actually apply this. Like, how do we actually do this? What do we do with all this information? And so I'll just leave on this slide, which is just a project that I've just started with a bunch of amazing collaborators, um, which is this idea of thinking about planning for abolition. And so, again, thinking about citizenship in a slightly different way, and I can talk about this more during the question and answer period if folks want. But part of it, um, you know, came out of... Um, um, a special issue and edit, an editorial that I put together with Justin Steele and Aditi Mehta, and also comes out of just years of work that I've done um, around re-entry specifically. And so it's this idea of thinking about um, our relationship as planners, as often state institutions with that other state institution that is so important in shaping and conditioning urban life, which is policing. <laughs> 
and trying to think about um, a form of planning where we can be removing ourselves from that process of policing and imagining another more sort of beautiful way of planning that doesn't involve um, that particular brand of nastiness. So that's just starting and I'm, hopefully I can come and chat with you about that project in the years to come. That's all I've got, thanks so much. Great, thanks so much. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna open it up to Q&A. So folks on Zoom, if you've got questions, drop those in the chat. And then for folks here, feel free to raise your hand and I can go ahead and call on you. Who wants to kick us off? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm actually an undergrad at Harvard College, but my question was, when you're engaging with an issue like the, the discourse going on in Denmark about parallel societies, when do you decide to accept the framing of like parallel societies and interrogate what that means and what its causes are? And when do you, in your research, decide that that framing is not like, like how do you decide to engage with that sort of discourse? Yeah. Um, I might not, I, course correct me if I'm not quite answering your question, but so in some way that's, that's for me is, I know in, some of this is weird, right? Because part of the like academic research thing is like a, a lot of it is just like weird wordsmithing, right? So it's like, is it parallel or is it interstitial? Is it anyways, but that to me, that is, an, it was important to actually think about it as not parallel, but interstitial, because I think parallel and again, there's also like the added layer of translation, but part of what that idea of like a of parallel society, right, in terms of the Danish state uh, dis discourse, right, it was really this idea of like, a, that of a choice, right, that like there is this Danish society, it's running along here, and that immigrant residents from non-Western places were making a, making a concerted choice to say like, oh, we don't wanna have anything to do with this. We wanna, you know, move around on our own end. And so I think that that image is, I think that that does not describe what people are experiencing and it does not describe how people are acting because people are acting in deeply engaged ways. It's not like people are in Denmark and they are not engaged in Denmark. They are deeply engaged in Denmark, but the difference is they are deeply engaged in their neighborhoods and in their communities where there is a space for them to engage, right? And so that's why I think about this idea of interstitial, right? As being these spaces that are, you know, that are closed off by something else. Right? It's not it's not a function of people making a choice to not be involved or engaged, but it's a function of people being closed off and uh, creating something new in that space. So, so I, th I think that a question of when do you engage and when do you not, I, I think we need to, I think we need to always interrogate, right, the stories that we're telling. And I think that we need to think about what evidence we're using, we're using, using, using. That answers your question, maybe not. Yeah. Okay, great. Anyone else have any questions? I've got one that was kind of running through my head as you were talking, and it's more of a question about how you um, think about the way that you yourself as a researcher are um, an audience as well, and how that might impact the way that your interlocutors are performing, um, forming citizenship as they are talking with you. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And especially like in these sort of, in all these different contexts. So again, like part of that is, so part of that becomes, you know, for me, right, this idea of sort of a multimodal research design becomes really important. Um, you know, so on the one hand, I might be sitting down with somebody and I'd be doing an interview with them, but I'm also hopefully like in that, well, okay, with the urban research projects, right, I was also in those spaces, right, in, in a lot of different ways, I was making multiple visits, I was volunteering in the youth program that happened in the basement, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was going to meetings and sitting quietly in the back. 
Um, so, so it wasn't just sort of like, oh, someone told me that, right? But it was like, oh, someone told me that. And then somebody else who was really different from that person told me that. And then I saw that other thing. Oh, and then I, you know, saw that image in that government document that also, so for me, it's that, you know, I mean, it's that it's the triangulation, but, you know, I really think about it as being more than that. Now, having said that, right, there's also definitely a question of positionality that I think is really, really important. So I come to this work as somebody who, um, you know, I was, I was, I was, I was going to say I was born in the country I was born in, but I was born in the country that I spent, you know, most of my childhood in, right? So I wasn't born an immigrant, but I um, have lived in the States uh, as an immigrant resident there and kind of back and forth. And I come from an immigrant community. So my parents weren't born in the country that I was born in. So, you know, I definitely come to this, right, with a particular perspective, right, and a particular idea about, you know, what immigration is, right, from having been raised in an immigrant community, having been an immigrant, having seen that, like, in different contexts. And even just like having like cousins in Canada in the States, right, and seeing the ways in which our life courses were quite distinct, right, because of those national contexts, I think already sort of set up my analysis in a particular way and sort of led me towards this more relational um, approach to thinking about this work. Uh, and then, you know, in the field, as we're supposed to say, which it's always a weird con, it's always a weird term, but you know, in the field, yeah, definitely your positionality is going to shift um, how it, how things work. I think for me, one of the funny ones is like, I have a name that does not, unless you are like, uh, unless you are like a West Indian auntie, my name does not read as like an immigrant name, right? Especially in the U.S. or in Canada. Um, so I would, sh I would, and I, and I, you know, I would often show up at people's doors, and they would be like, "Oh, you were not who I was expecting," and people would, and people would, they would interact with me in a very different way, right? Like I would get invited to things. Like at first they were like, "Oh, we'll talk to this weird student from the states," but then I would get invited to things that I wouldn't have gotten invited to otherwise, definitely. And so I think that that's really important, especially for those of us who are working inside of our communities. I think when we work outside of our communities, there's there's a lot of sort of chatter about the ethics of that work. But when you're working inside your community, there's a lot of important ethics work that have to, has to happen as well. I was definitely told stuff that people wouldn't necessarily have told other researchers. And so it's always that idea of like balancing, right? What is being told to you um, because of who you are and because of a relationship that's being built and what's being told to you as a researcher. And so there's definitely things that I didn't necessarily put in or that I didn't attribute in certain ways because, um, because they were being told to me in a slightly different role. Someone said this thing once in a, in a workshop that I went to, like in my like first or second year as a PhD student that I always remember, which was the idea that you never want to put words in your interviewer's mouth, but that it's okay to let them put words in your mouth. And so there might be something that somebody has said that is that, that if you attribute it to them in any way would sort of be a bit controversial, but that you can just sort of say as, as a researcher to kind of protect that, uh, that relationship. I don't know if that answers your question, but no, it does. Great, it's it's okay. great. Thank you, great. Stefan. I Stephane? think that's a, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, well, thanks uh, so much, Professor Simpson. That was a fantastic presentation, and I love the research design. At first, I thought the the cases were so different, but then uh, as as you kept talking, I realized how similar they are, and I think there's a lot to a lot to learn from that. Um, I wanted to ask whether there's either been an historical element to your research or whether you might be interested in going in that direction. Uh, because, you know, I, I've been thinking about the kind of the hardening boundary lines of citizenship over time, for example, in the United mm -hmm. States, right, with the border, the border patrol, the creation of that, or Native American citizenship. And, and I guess you've you discussed like the importance of the kind of late liberal, neoliberal moment in uh, Denmark and Canada. I'm curious if like, if we were to look at these same questions in the same place in like the 19th century and the 20th mm -hmm. century, would we see some changes? I don't know if you've thought about those kind of questions, but yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, the answer is yes, and yes, and then yes again. <laughs> so I think, um, so it's funny, my, my advisor, my master's advisor um, uh, is an amazing 
a scholar and practitioner named Miriam Chion, who's from Peru. And she had this funny thing that her advisor had said to her, like you know, the genealogy of it, but had said to her where he was like, yeah, the thing about all my American students is they want to start yesterday. Like, they want to start every project like yesterday. He's like, the problem with my Latin American students is they want to start everything in like 1642. And by the time they get today, they've like run out of funding and they've run out of time. And they, so, so she was telling me this in the context of being like, she's like, I don't know. You're, she's like, you're acting like a Latin American student. So, but I, so I think like, you know, even though my work is often quite contemporary, I think one of the things that I always find myself doing is that like looking backwards, right? So it's, you know, even when I was, you know, working on the, you know, when I was working on this project in theory, the, you know, when I started this project, the, the, the sort of comparative, right? It was just supposed to be about, yes, what was going on today and that like neoliberalization. But I like found myself in like archives, like reading about like, you know, Danish educational reform in the 1800s. Like I just kind of couldn't help myself. And I think, you know, I think that multi-scalar aspect has to also be temporal, um, you know, because I think you're exactly right. Not only do these things shift, but again, right, when we think about that idea of like shaping and conditioning, right? The historic conditions, obviously, you know, shape and condition what's possible in the present. So uh, in terms of the work in Parkland, that work is, there's a chunk of that that I didn't talk about today that is much, or I didn't talk about very much today, that is much more expressly um, historical. And it is, it, it's expressly that idea of trying to trace um, these memories, like as, as memory became like a really important aspect, right, of how people were claiming citizenship, it became, it's become a process of trying to trace these stories. So like, where do these, mem where do these stories about who is a citizenship come from? And so I've been tracing those backwards. Um, and like I said, back towards um, when people sort of as you know, settlers started to um, write community histories, right? And they started really early. Like it was in sort of like the, you know, the early 1800s, people were already writing these sort of like little community histories. So I've been sort of tracing those backwards, but also trying to intersperse them with, um, you know, for example, um, there's this really great history that somebody did of a, a friendship center, which is a, an indigenous organization that was sort of set up for folks that were moving into towns. Um, so you know, there's like great one from like the 80s that I've been looking at as like another sort of point. So again, yes, trying to sort of trace how that narrative has shifted and changed. Right. Yeah, thanks for that great question. Yeah, anyone else have some questions? I do have another one if no one has another question. Um, I'm just wondering if through the course of your research, you had any conversations about how these different immigrants um, are audience, audiencing the citizenship of the state or of the municipality themselves and how that came up in conversation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great question. I think, you know, the way that I think I've been framing it here, right, is, a, is in part, it's that idea of, um, yeah, of trying to like center immigrant residents. Um, so putting them on that stage in that sort of performance role and trying to like decenter um, state actions. Having said that, people have thoughts. <laughs> like people have thoughts, right? And that, and to be honest with you, again, like that idea of like that relational aspect, right? It, again, it came out of like listening to people's thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. Where, where you know, where immigrant like immigrant residents have a really strong analysis, right, of the places they're they're in because nothing is taken for granted, right? When you move someplace new, nothing you don't take anything for granted. You're looking at everything anew. So folks actually have really had really strong analysis um, of these places, and you know that the that last that last quote that I sort of went through, um, that quote in Denmark, right? Like that was one of the really important quotes that came up was just again like people talked a lot about just the difficulty of entering even just like casual Danish society. Like there was a sort of like tragic, not tra it was just like a, I don't know, it's one of those stories that sticks with you, but somebody told this story of like, um, of like having, you know, gone to the park one day and like finally meeting, you know, finally like meeting this like this Danish couple that would talk to them and chat with them. They had this whole day and they laughed and they talked and they even exchanged numbers and they were so excited. And then like not getting the call back <laughs> right, from their new Danish friends. And so their joke was sort of like, yeah, they're really, really cold unless until you work with them for a really long time or when they're drunk, then they'll talk to you. But it was sort of this like reoccurring, like it really was this reoccurring theme, right? Of this sort of like the, in, of like a, the insular nature. In the flip side, right, on, in the Canadian case, there was this 
this kind of constant sense of um, a really distinct separation between sort of like uh, professional relationships and personal relationships. So that idea that like you had access to like a certain amount of like very formal resources um, that people would sort of talk to you at work, but like it was very different from like, but your neighbor like would never say hello to you. Mm -hmm. And again, right, I think we often underestimate, right, the importance of those sort of more social ties, right, in terms of gaining resources, in terms of gaining access to information, right, that if you have a society where like information is hoarded, right, or, or where the so, sort of social ties to, um, in, to gain material resources are hoarded, right, it makes it that much more difficult for people to, to you know, make those, to make the connections that they then need to, be able to make themselves citizens. So yeah, people had thoughts. <laughs> people had lots of thoughts. Great, thanks. Yeah. If there, yeah, Maureen, go ahead. Thank you so much, Professor Simpson. That was a fascinating presentation. Um, my question is in regards to the issue of temporality that you spoke briefly about. And I was wondering if you found maybe like a relationship between um, the legal status of citizenship mm -hmm. and how your interlocutors were performing uh, citizen, you know, citizenship for membership. Um, and if that had changed, depending on where they were in the process of becoming like legal citizens, because I'm mm -hmm. guessing your interlocutors were like in different stages of Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It's a question that I get a lot. And I think, you know, part of the thing that's interesting to me is, I, so in some ways I'm trying to be led by what I'm hearing. Like that's, that's sort of genuinely like something I'm trying to do. And something that's actually interesting to me is that as I reflected, as I like went back and looked through that, people don't talk about formal citizenship nearly as much as I would expect them to. And so you're exactly right that I was interviewing some people who did have formal citizenship. I was interviewing people that like didn't, um, there's definitely a, there's definitely like sort of a threshold, like folks who had only been in a country for like, you know, a year or two, there's definitely a distinction between those folks and then folks who'd been in the country for, you know, two, three, four, five, ten 10 years. And I mostly have been trying to talk to folks who have been, who are sort of in their first 10 years in all of these projects. Um, when I'm, the interviews that I've been doing have generally been with folks who've been sort of 10 years or less in a place. Um, but so yeah, there's definitely like a threshold that like, you know, once somebody's been someplace for like two or three or four years that like something does shift. But you know, in, Can in the Canadian context, I think, uh, and now I'm forgetting for some reason the exact rules, but you know, people can get citizenship, I think around year five-ish, don't quote me on that. I don't, sorry, for some reason the numbers are falling out of my brain and I can't entirely remember why. In Denmark, it's definitely like more difficult. It's, you know, it's definitely like a, a slightly more cumbersome process. Um, um, but even there, you know, I spoke sort of in kind of like some parallel or separate kind of parallel, but in some separate work, I was speaking to a lot of folks um, because Denmark has this sort of like idea of like, you know, people, people who are immigrant residents themselves, but then also people who are descendants of non-Western immigrants. I did talk to a lot of young adults um, who were, you know, first generation Danish or like Danish born or whatever, you know, however, whatever different phrases you want. So these are folks that have lived their whole lives in Denmark and, you know, they are Danish citizens and their narratives were like surprisingly similar to a lot of the folks who had moved there um, internationally. So I, so formal citizenship is important, obviously, like it affords you like a certain, a certain set of particular rights. Like in the Danish case, for example, um, there's this whole, there's all this mishigas around purchasing property. Like you can't purchase property as a non-Danish person without getting the approval of the state. And then you have to like report back every year to prove that you're still living there. And so there's even like just sort of funny things like that. So yes, it definitely like impacts people's lives. But I think I've been surprised by, I've, I've been surprised, not surprised by how much people's actions are not conditioned purely through formal citizenship. I think that's that's actually been kind of surprising. It's not that surprising though. I mean, I think in the States, you know, there's sort of, you know, a lot of really amazing literature around, you know, just undocumented political activism as well. And I'm forgetting, there's a lot of great pieces that I'm forgetting the, the names of right now, but around sort of like undocumented residents, political um, 
you know, engagement and organizing, right? And sort of trying to tease out how and when and where people who are undocumented um, engage in political processes, right? And that might, that's everything from sort of like getting your name, that's everything from like protesting to just like getting friends and family members who are citizens to vote since you can't vote, right? So people still act as citizens even without formal status. And I think that that's uh, an important part of what that kind of framing of ordinary citizenship helps us to think about. That was a really circuitous answer, but I wanted to just kind of make sure that I was not being dismissive <laughs> of that idea of, of formal citizenship. But yeah, I, I'm in some ways, I think I'm kind of surprised by how much in people's ordinary lives they don't necessarily talk about that. Yeah, Anna, go ahead. Um, hi, uh, thank you, first of all, for your lecture. It was uh, amazing to hear. Uh, I have a question and I'm not sure if you addressed it. I'm just curious to uh, hear like, why did you choose uh, Denmark and Copenhagen as your European case? Like what led to your decision in this case? Yeah, that's a good question Ooh, that I had to justify at the time. Um, so yeah, so for me, like I said, you know, one of the things I was thinking about was I was trying to think about and understand, well, there's a couple of reasons, some of which are like good and legitimate and some of which are like maybe like for the informal chat. But, um, you know, what I was trying to think with, I was trying to think with these places that were not sort of classic um, receiving spaces for immigrant residents. So I wasn't going to look at London, you know, I wasn't going to look at New York, I wasn't going to look at Toronto, right? I was looking at these places where there was um, in that moment uh, a substantial immigrant resident, you know, immigrant population, and also where it had grown, and also where it was a discussion, where it was sort of a place that people were talking about. So when I started this work, um, you know, um, so that so that was the one hand, there's like the, the immigrant resident side of it. The other side of it, again, was like sort of what where the nation states were in terms of this sort of processes of liberalization and neoliberalization. So the for the original study um, that I you know started with, um, there's actually there's there were three cases. So there was also an American case that I didn't talk about as much today for different reasons. But so I was looking at these sort of like different stages of neoliberalization and thinking about them in the context, for example, of you know thinking about different flavors of welfare states. So thinking about you know the U.S. as sort of like the strong liberal example. Thinking about like the Nordic region as being that kind of like soft, strong social democratic region and thinking about Canada as being that like weird hybrid that was sort of in between. And then at the time, it was also interesting because the ways in which the Nordic countries were addressing these two questions, these sort of economic, these urban economic questions and these immigrant questions were also diverging and have continued to verge, diverge in interesting ways. Um, so to be honest about it, given my druthers, I probably would have wanted to be in Norway because it's like, you know, it's everyone's just a lot nicer there, but Denmark was the one that actually made a lot more sense. And if you are Danish, I apologize, but um, Den, um, but uh, Denmark was the one that just like made a lot more sense because of the ways that the state was responding in sort of very strong ways um, and very sort of strong negative ways in terms of immigration. But then at the same time, um, we're maintaining some of the more social democratic aspects of their urban economics or maintaining them in a, in a in a different way than the other Nordic countries. So that was the, so yeah, it was that it was that weird balance between sort of like what people were doing in terms of immigration and what people were doing in terms of that ec urban economics or trying to find um, kind of like a balance between them. Great, I think we're just at time. So Thank you very much for your talk, for the wonderful responses to the Q&A section. Um, and so we hope to see you all next week for another lit lecture. Again, here there will be food provided to tell all your friends to come. Um, great, so thank you so much. Why don't you take a couple of minutes and then we'll do the tech stuff so we can have the PhD chat afterwards. Perfect. Thank Thanks you again so much, everybody. everybody.